Joyous greetings. Welcome once more to Law and Life Matters. Masawala Mutimele with you to host today. We are exploring the history and the application of the Constitution, also known as Act 108 of 1996. To take us through this topic, we have Dr. Slash Professor Tepo Madlingozi with us. Now, Prof needs no introduction, but just so that we are all on the same page, I'm going to let you know who it is exactly that we have with us today. So Dr. Madlingozi holds the following degrees. Firstly, an LLB, followed by an LLM, an M Social Science, all from the University of Pretoria. He holds a PhD from Burberg University of London. He is a renowned critical analyst and activist with a passion for rectification, transformation and decolonization. He has served on various human rights boards and social justice organizations. He has also been a consultant to the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Pan-African Parliament. He has served on Project 25 of the Advisory Committee of the South African Law Commission. He has worked as a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Law for an amazing, incredible 16 years and is currently sitting as the Associate Professor and Director at the, Center of, at the Center of Applied Legal Studies at the University of Witwatersrand. So um, welcome, 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 Professor Madlingozi. How are you this afternoon? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, uh, it's cold here in Johannesburg, but I'm feeling okay. Thank you. Ah, that's great. How does it feel to have, um, to hear all those accolades that you've collected throughout your life? Does it feel normal? Does it, is it surprising? It is surprising. <laughs> I thought you were talking about someone else. <laughs> it's always a, an out of body experience because, of course, when we do this job, we are focused on, you know, assisting where we can assist, teaching where we can teach. Uh, and yeah, our, our colleagues just come as a bonus, as people recognizing you, but also they serve to encourage other people to also follow the same path. So they, they are not just individual alcoholics, they also serve that kind of function, a societal function. Mm, mm, definitely, they're very, very, very inspiring. Now, Professor, we have today this topic um, the history and the application of the constitution. And just as a, a lay person, uh, for me, I know growing up, we've always heard that the constitution, specifically the South African constitution is amongst, if not one of the very best and most elite in the entire world. But I sometimes wonder to myself how accessible it is to the ordinary South African on, on the street or next door. Um, it can sometimes feel like it's, it's not so accessible. So um, I want to find out from you, um, do you feel that it reflects our history, living conditions and our progressive ambitions? Question is in four parts. Uh, the first question is about access. Uh, access to the constitution but also it speaks to the question of constitutional literacy. How do people know the constitution? Do they know the constitution and how well they know that? So let's start there. Here we can say, you know, there are three kinds of people. The majority of South Africans have heard about the constitution, about Mulao Tewa, you know, in various languages. They know that this is a supreme law. They know that this is a law that they can invoke to protect their rights. But as far as the content of the right, they don't know what it is about. You know, so when you ask people, you know, what are your rights in terms of the constitution? You will get a number of answers. Some of them, not two, you know. People say, no, I've got the right to land. I've got the right to electricity and things like that, you know, rights that are not in the constitution. So the majority know about the constitution, but they are not aware of the contents of the constitution and how to use it. 
So that's mm. the majority. I would say 60% to even 70% of people. The second category of people do know about the constitution. They do know some of the rights that are in the constitution. But they lack the ability to implement it. Mm. Because they have no access to lawyers. They have no access to uh, institutions that they can, you know, appeal to, to enforce the constitution. And then you've got a small minority, 5% of the population that have constitutional literacy, that has ability to invoke the constitution, Mm. to threaten to you know, uh, 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 implement their rights and also to hire lawyers. But mm. the majority of people, you know, I would say, you know, there's no access to the constitution. Mm. The second question that you ask is about whether it reflects the history of South Africa. Yes. Now, that's a very difficult question because of course, as you know, the question of history is implemented or is understood from multiple perspectives. Mm. Some people think the history of South Africa is a history of conflict between black people and white people. Mm. Some people think the history of South Africa is a history of colonialism, where a white settler minority came, invaded, dispossessed, and waged war on black people. So not a conflict, but a situation of war uh, by the settlers. So that is a, so. So the multiple understanding of the of, of the history of this country, mm. and because of that, it is difficult to say the constitution reflects the history of the country. Mm. We can say the following: the constitution reflects the history as understood by the ANC and by the National Party. Those two uh, groups reached a compromise and put a framework in place. So the history reflects the history. Some people think the history of this country is about gender-based violence. That doesn't come through enough in In the the constitution. constitution. Mm -hmm. So I would say to answer your second question, it's very difficult to say this because history is contested. Mm. Understanding of history is contested. Does it reflect the lived condition of the majority? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. Issues to do with institutionalized racism, issues to do with, you know, the need for reparation, the need for redress, the need for land uh, restitution, issues to deal with gender justice, not just women's rights, but gender justice. You don't see these issues articulated clearly. And that's because of the second question that I reflected upon, which is that, you know, uh, history is contested Mm. and the history being contested what you get in the document is a compromise, right? Mm. And a compromise that overwhelmingly, not solely, but overwhelmingly safeguards the privileges of those who were beneficiaries of apartheid. So the Mm. constitution doesn't tell us how do we fundamentally redistribute resources, you know, epistemic resources, cultural resources, material resources, and so forth. Fundamentally, not through socioeconomic rights, but how do you say that in a country where a crime against humanity was committed and white people benefited so much, how do you redress that? The constitution there is lacking. So it reflects a maybe, to a certain extent, a distributive justice paradigm, distributive to a certain extent, not enough, but it doesn't reflect clearly a reparative, a anti-colonial, an anti-racist framework. It doesn't give us a so I'll
how you answered the first two questions absolutely crushed the ideal that a lot of us as millennials grew up believing and and learning to be what the constitution is. So um, I'm just going to ask again, does it at least reflect our progressive ambitions as a nation? The, 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 so this, this is a very uh, big question because one, there is no nation, right? South Africa is not a nation. It has no shared ideas. It has no shared principles. It has no shared social contact. So you cannot say this is a nation. It's a country with multiple groups contesting the space mm. along ethnic lines, I think along racial lines, along gender lines, along class lines even. So you cannot say that this is a nation. There was <laughs> never an attempt at nation building. Mm. The constitution has also, and it's not the constitution's fault because it's, you know, uh, the constitution is a framework, but we don't have a framework for how do you build a nation? What does this nation unite you know, around? So that's the first answer. There is no nation. What are the aspirations, therefore, of the majority? Hmm. In a context where 74% of the youth is unemployed. In the context where gender-based violence is normalized. In the context where the killing and the rape of queer people is not a scandal. It happens every week. We go on Twitter, we cry, but it is almost normalized. So the mm. aspiration are the aspiration about you know employment, about no hunger, about no gender-based violence. And the constitution to a certain extent does say how we can achieve that. But, you know, we are not there yet. So, and I think, you know, the problem is that, as I said, the constitution is not honest about the history. What is the history? The constitution said the history is the history of conflict. Well, conflict between who? When there was a question of colonialism. So you cannot have a foundational document whose history is not clearly articulated, that will then be able to, you know, provide a template for nation building. Mm. And of course, this is complicated by the TRC, which also tried to do nation building along false, you know, uh, uh, false framework, you know, the framework that the conflict was about individuals you know, uh, individual perpetrator, individual victim, give them reparation, give them amnesty. That's not how you build a nation, you know, because that's not true. The conflict was a colonial conflict. So, mm. so, so, so that's the answer to your question. We can't answer this question because there's no nation. There's no nation because there's never been a honest nation building, you know, process. And there's never been such a process because the overwhelming drive is to calm white fears. White people should, you know, not be threatened. They should, you know, know that they've got a place here, which is well and fine and noble, you know, ideal, but it cannot happen when it is based on a lie. So that would be the answer to that question. Mm. Thank you so much. I, you know, I'm learning it's good to speak to somebody who is considered an elder when addressing such matters. Now, my question then becomes, because we have simply crushed the document <laughs> at this stage, we're almost standing as if, you know, we don't have much to work with. Now, so my question to you becomes, who, who then are the main role players in holding um, leaders or all parties involved accountable and are they doing enough whether it's us whether it's our leaders 
who who then needs to take accountability for this situation that we're sitting with, which is our constitution, in which case you have answered that it doesn't currently reflect our history, living conditions, nor our progressive ambitions? So the, the, the first answer, of course, would be that the executive must be held accountable by parliament, right? Parliament must hold the executive accountable. But of course, the parliament that we have now does not do so because the majority of parliamentarians come from a party that is in the executive and they simply just implement the decisions of the party, you know, along party lines. Mm. So parliament as a mechanism of executive accountability is not happening, it's not doing that. Mm. The second layer there are institutions of democracy. Mm. Chapter nine institutions, the South African Human Rights Commission, the Public Protector, the CRL Commission, uh, uh, and so forth and so forth, the gender, uh, uh, what is it called? The Commission for Gender Equality and so forth. Mm. Then we can say, you know, uh, the, the situation is mixed. Some mm. of these institutions are trying. Some of them are not holding the executive accountable because the people that have been employed there as commissioners are beneficiaries of CADA deployment, mm. deployed by the party. Therefore, there's no way that they're going to hold the executive accountable. So we're not really seeing this chapter nine institutions biting and holding the executive accountable. The third layer is the media. The media is doing its best. We are lucky in South Africa, we still have an independent, robust media. Mm. We can criticize that it's factional. It's okay that it's factional, as long as all the factions are reflected. You know, that's fine. We don't mm. expect it to be objective. There can never be objectivity, but at least the media is doing its best. Investigative journalists are really exposing a lot and holding the executive accountable. We then have civil society. Once again, there we have, you know, a mixed, you know, bag. Some groups are doing their best. Some are just focused on, you know, donor funding uh, and taking instructions from the donors and being accountable to donors more than being accountable to the public. But civil society in South Africa is doing its best, taking matters to court, publishing critical reports, going to the media and so forth. Mm. The other layer, of course, is the judiciary. Yes. The judiciary is the custodian of the constitution. Mm. We have an independent judiciary in South Africa. We have a judiciary that is not corrupt. We have an independent judiciary that is not scared of the executive. We must be very clear and very you know, happy about that. So the judiciary is still doing its best. The problem is about access to justice. Who is taking those cases to the courts? Right, and mm -hmm. therefore, whose matters are reflected? That's where it becomes very tricky, there, right? But ultimately, who must hold the executive accountable? It must be ordinary people, mm. it must be the youth. Do we have strong leadership among the youth? Do we have strong movements around? Uh, youth issues, I am yet to see that. I see the youth very active on Twitter, very active on Facebook. They cry about something and tomorrow they're on to something else. But I don't see a coherent <laughs> vision and leadership from the youth. And mm -hmm. as I said, in the first place, it's because of massive undereducation. Massive mm -hmm. undereducation, massive underemployment. So to expect that the youth must always be marching, must always be holding the seat accountable, it's also unfair when people are hungry, you know? And I'm, I'm not using hunger here as a metaphor. I'm using hunger literally. They are hungry, they're on the streets looking for jobs. So, you know, one should not blame the youth. Mm. So but, in mm. this context where political parties are also just concerned with going into parliament, and fighting their beggars within the party. We do not as yet 
have a coherent, a powerful movement holding the state accountable. Mm. During apartheid, we knew what we were fighting against. We knew who we were fighting. It's very difficult now in mm. the context of a democratic state. So there's no clear vision about who we should be fighting against or what we should be fighting against. In, mm. Also in the context, finally, of a very materialist, capitalist, neoliberal society, which encourages two things. Consumption, 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 materialism, 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 right? Mm. And therefore individualism. So really one should not be harsh on anyone. It is a context that we're operating in, a capitalist, individualistic framework that makes movement building very, very difficult. But FISMA's fall was an example of what is possible. The Me Too movement is also an example of what can be achieved if we are united around certain issues. Mm. The last thing that I will say is the so-called service delivery protest are uh, a big, big movement to hold executive accountable. We have more than 2,000 social protests every year. 2,000. How many days are there in a year? And you compare it to 2,000. So every day, we have multiple communities rising up, holding municipalities accountable. They are underreported. You only hear about them when you are listening to the traffic news. Oh, don't go this way. People are protesting, right? Mm. But really... So-called service delivery protests, even though they are localized, even though they are sometimes issue-based, issue-based meaning, you know, for water, for electricity, for small things like that. But really, these are spaces of accountability. Mm. Uh, uh, and the last thing to say, I, I keep saying less, the last thing to say is that every time people try to hold the state accountable, especially poor black communities, they get repressed by huge police brutality or by threats. So really, it's very, very difficult for people to put their lives on the line like that. Mm. The last actually, thing, very last thing. Actually, Prof, the Constitution um, is not Professor, can I, can I, <laughs> I'm so sorry to cut you short before you finish your answer. I just really feel that I should bring a, a different perspective to you with regards to what you said about the youth. Um, yeah. You know, I feel like, as you've mentioned, fees must fall is a beautiful example of what is possible. And the paradox yeah. of it being something that we all experienced in this current generation, um, I think is something that is both beautiful and tragic. Now, you know, my question then becomes, as a young person, as part of that youth that you're speaking of, who is supposed to hold um, power to account, what then um, do we say about the responsibility that our elders have towards us? Because I'm asking yeah, yeah. because, you know, um, mm -hmm. we tried as young people, you know, and I, the youth often get lambasted for the conditions that the country <laughs> is currently in. And I feel like it's an unfair burden to place on us because um, we do try, we try. But as you've already mentioned, all those other factors that cause fragments within how we organize and how we, 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 we protest then becomes a, a, a much bigger issue. So it ends up looking as if as the youth, we are unfocused. We are, you know, we are all over the place. We only care about being Twitter activists. And dare I say that that is not an, an, an adequate, adequate reflection of of our, our of our current state, so I just want to get your thoughts briefly on that. What is our what is the what are the elders' responsibility teased towards the youth, or if there is none, if we're giving up on the elders, then how can we then make sure that as the youth we are able to to sort of organize and mitigate the tension between um, democracy and and disruption, as well as um, mitigating the tension between um, you know being unfocused and being repressed? Yes, no, 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 no. I, I, I've already said how the elders are failing in parliament, in civil society, in 
uh, and in all those spaces in chapter nine institutions, those are the elders, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm saying that they are failing, right? They 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 must bear a huge burden of responsibility. I'm also saying that one should not blame the youth because of one unemployment, poverty, despair, which comes with nyaupe, teenage pregnancies, and so forth. I'm also saying that Fist Must Fall was a beautiful example, but was repressed. And also there was internal fracture within the movement along class lines, along gender lines, along sexuality. You know, we know that, right? Mm. So I'm not blaming the youth upset. You know, from I've, I've gone from parliament all the way down that we must blame this. Yes. But change will come if this intergenerational collaboration intergenerational working together that means that old people must listen to the youth <laughs> they must be able to learn from the youth the youth must also be willing to listen and learn from elders and not just say you guys came you guys failed to hell with you guys of course the elders have failed but they're also in their failure they can tell you the lessons that you must you know avoid mm. so you don't make the same mistake so I agree with you, intergenerational collaboration, intergenerational movement, uh, the way to go. Mm. Okay. Um, I've heard you speak about a post-conquest constitution. It sounds like we may be in, in urgent need of that constitution. I just want you, if you can, please briefly share with um, our listeners what that ideal is about and um how, what is it and how can it be realized? So the idea of a post-conquest constitution comes from a decolonization or decoloniality perspective. So to understand that a post-conquest constitution, we should understand this perspective. From a constitutional perspective, Mm. the Decolonial perspective is based on two pillars. The first pillar is the notion that 1994 did not lead to a post-colonial dispensation. South Africa was not decolonized in 1994. It was democratized, but not decolonized. Mm. The second pillar is to say that the constitution is constituted and constitute this situation of no decolonization. This is to say that the scholars from this perspective and activists allege that the constitution is complicit in our inability, or not in our ability, in our failure to usher in a post-colonial situation in a sense that it constitutes this dispensation, but it is also constituted by this dispensation. So the first pillar one, 1994, meant that South Africa was not decolonized. Mm -hmm. Number two, the constitution bears some, not all, responsibility. Mm. And by ongoing conquest or ongoing neo-colonialism, we mean about four things. Mm. Colonialism meant four things. Colonialism meant one, land dispossession, two, economic subjugation, meaning that people that you conquer, you make them into tools of you know, racial capitalism. So economic subjugation. Three, it meant you know, uh, the subjugation of their knowledge system, their religious system, and so forth. Mm. And then lastly, colonialism meant you institutionalize racism, ableism, homophobia, sexism, and so forth, and so forth, right? That's what colonialism meant. Those four things, Mm -hmm. land, economy, knowledge system, and jurisprudence, uh, meaning uh, legal system. Uh, Number four, institutionalization of, you know, all forms of discrimination. That is colonialism. Mm. 1994 did not reverse all of that, the land is still not in the hands of the majority. 
the majority are still underclass, still economically subjugated to a minority. Mm. The education system, the legal system, the cultural framework in South Africa is still Eurocentric. And then lastly, who can argue that racism is institutionalized, ableism is institutionalized, sexism, homophobia, and so forth. So there is a situation of ongoing conquest. Mm. The constitution does not give us a framework to decolonize and to reverse all those four things. Mm. So a post-conquest constitution, therefore, is a constitution that will lead to a post-conquest framework, a constitution that will clearly deal with these four issues. It don't talk about social economic rights alone. It will talk about the reparation, restitution, and redress. It don't talk only about individual rights and individual claims. It will talk about how do you structurally, institutionally, change all and dismantle all these forms of discrimination, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what a post-conquest constitution is about. It is based on this idea that South Africa is not decolonized, and therefore it's a proposal to come up with a constitution which will lead to a dismantling of this long situation of colonization, not colonialism, colonization, colonization, which is still continuing. Ongoing. Mm. Yes. Yo, uh, Prof, like, I just want to say that um, you speak very passionately about this. And even though one may have a stance that is, that holds the constitution in very high regard and, um, you know, has more liberal views about it, I, I end up becoming um, convinced of all that you are bringing forth today. So at that stage now, I need to ask, should we still go ahead and vote this year? What is the importance of, you know, our local government elections that are happening this year? Um, should Is this an area that South Africans need to pay attention to? Or should we rather organize towards... Um, creating this um, new post-conquest constitution? I will say two things there, because you also asked about the constitution. Mm. The first thing to say is that the constitution that we have now is not useless. Mm. It doesn't mean we must not use it. Mm. Impoverished people, women, sexual minorities, migrants, and so forth, must use all the weapons in their disposal. Mm. The constitution should and can still be used to prevent evictions, to prevent, you know, uh, police from killing people, you know, to prevent so many things. So the constitution, I must emphasize, is not useless. Mm -hmm. It must be used, but it must be used strategically. It must not be used as the end goal. You must know the limitations of the constitution. You must use it and push the envelope. But you must also use the constitution as a means towards movement building. So don't just go to court and you think you won and that's it. No. Use the constitution that we have now with all its limitations, with all its imperfections to build a movement. Hmm. A post-conquest constitution is a long-term you know, idea Vision. Mm. that we have now, we must use, but with understanding of its limitations. Should the youth still vote? Yeah, not just to the youth. decolonize everybody. South Africa, mm. to dismantle all these things that I've spoken about, we need a movement. Does voting lead to movement building? Or does voting only lead to voting the same parties that have not proven to change. I don't know. Mm. I will answer the way I've answered about the constitution. Mm. Use elections also as a tool, not as a be all and end all. Use it tactically. Go to these parties and say, as a youth, we demand one, two, three, four. Mm. Put them in your manifesto and tell us how we're going to hold you accountable 
if you don't implement this. Unfortunately, our, our electoral system does not allow, you know, direct, you know, accountability. Mm. You know, so you can, I cannot just say, here in my neighborhood, this is who we have voted for, we yes. should remove them. At the local level, maybe we can do that, but not when we vote every four to five years. Mm. So, do vote, do play the game of asking for specific things, but continue advocating and implementing a participatory, deliberative democracy. I mean, not a democracy where you just tick a box every four years, and if you are sick, good luck. But a democracy where it is about ongoing decision-making consultation mm. and ongoing accountability of those that you have. The mm. last thing that I would say is that who is prepared to vote during this pandemic. It is really unsafe to vote when this pandemic is still at the level that it's at, where mm. we don't have vaccines, where we don't have PPEs, where there's been so much corruption. I don't know if it's safe. So I'm not talking politically, I'm talking from a public health perspective. Mm. I don't know if it's safe to vote, yes. Okay. Yo, we have so little time left and I have more than six questions remaining, but I'm going to choose my best three and I'm going to move away from <laughs> all the, um, the, the academic uh, issues we're discussing. Just on a personal level, Prof, we want to find out from you of all the acc- accolades that you have gathered over the years, which one of them is the most meaningful to you and why? Yo, 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 I don't know, eh? Uh... No, I think, you know, every time I am invited to sit on a board of a social movement, mm. you, know, uh, I, you know, it really is pleasing for me because one is the recognition that I'm not an academic, I'm an intellectual activist mm. that can contribute to movement building. But it's also heartening for me because it's a contribution in movements that are trying to change lives, whether it's about, you know, membership of the board of Amandla.mobi or Makua, which is a mining, you know, affected mining committees united in action uh, and so forth. You know, for Mm. me, that's always an honor to be able to be invited to those spaces because that is about contributing to movement building and not just, you know, an individual endeavor, you know. But yeah, for me, that would be my number one ongoing accolade. Not the ones where I'm recognized for my academic achievements mm. or where I'm recognized for my individual contribution to the sector. Mm. And, you know, that's, that's the extensive work that you do can get quite... Um, mentally stressful so we also want to find out as young people do you get do you ever get discouraged and if so what keeps you motivated or do you are you always on you know um on a roll and ready to rock and roll or do you have moments where you feel like this situation that i'm working in or working towards is hopeless um what what are you what has been your personal experience in that regard no, 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 I do have moments like that, you know. I, I was a, you know, uh, national advocacy coordinator for Kudumani, the yes, movement yes. of victims of apartheid mm. for, you know, about 15 years, you know, mm. where we were fighting for reparations, accountability, and redress. Mm. And to see, you know, those people who were brutalized by apartheid being ignored and being ridiculed by the new state is very painful. Mm. Every week we had to bury, you know, one of our members, you know, people with bullets within their bodies, still lodged within their bodies, people who still needed, you know, uh, prosthetic limbs, people who still needed psychological services, you know, dying without redress. Mm. You know, that led to clinical depression, right? Because Mm. it's really, really depressing. So, you know, that experience taught me two things. Mm. One, know that the struggle is long-term. Mm. 
mm. and the struggle continues and that you won't be able to achieve what you set out to achieve with your movement, you know, during your contribution, that you can leave a movement mm. without having received what you were looking for, mm. right? But so the second thing that you taught me is also is that it's about the purity of your contribution, mm. the nobility of your contribution, not what you achieve, but are you giving it your all from an honest place and from a place where you don't want individual accolades, mm. where you don't even publish all the things that you achieve. Mm. So for me, you know, that keeps me going. Mm. Two last things is the need for self-care and collective care, right? Mm. Mm. And this means, you know, going to consult and see therapists, mm. sangomas, or mm. anything that will spiritually uplift you, right? Uh, psychologically uplift you, I mean, right? So the need to debrief. Yeah. You need to be able to separate work from home, right? Mm. Uh, uh, and lastly, that activism must be underlined by spirituality. Activism mm. must always be underlined by spirituality. Spirituality here meaning two things. One, the idea that there is a purpose bigger than yourself. That is spirituality. Mm. The idea that I am nothing. There is, I'm being brought here for a purpose mm. and discovering that purpose. And then two, the knowledge that we are interconnected as human beings. Mm. I am because you are, because you are, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. So one, the notion of a bigger purpose, mm. bigger energy, bigger definity, whatever you want to call it. And mm. two, the idea of interconnection. Once your activism is rooted in spirituality, you'll be able to know that, you know, you are nothing. Don't think that you can change the world by yourself. Mm. To know that people will betray you, your own comrades, they will make deals with the state, or you know when they get promoted, they will leave the struggle, or they you know are just interested in publications and you know individual actually know that that's fine. Mm. We all have our own purpose in life. So spirituality, not religion, I will really emphasize as a key to activism but also this idea that you must take care of yourself mentally, mm. emotionally, spiritually. Mm. But lastly, to say that, you know, my name is Tepo, so I cannot, ho I cannot afford to lose hope. To you not? Know? <laughs> because my name is Tepo, meaning hope and faith, I need to, you know, yeah, fall down and get back up, fall down and back up, yeah. Mm. You know, can can we all be activists, Prof? Is it something that all of us are activists? Mm. Yeah. All what of us it? are activists. All of us are activists at home. Mm. When you advocate for, you know, gender parity, that your brother must also wash dishes. Mm. When you advocate that your mother must be recognized for the work that she's doing unpaid. Mm. When you advocate for change at your school, at your university, that's activism. Mm. when you take care of other people to the extent that you can take care of them, mm. meaning, you know, you know, helping people who don't have enough, you know, uh, contributing and, and not holding all the privileges to yourself, using your education and your privilege to better society. That's activism. Teaching is activism. Writing is activism. Mm. Podcasting and therefore conscientizing people. It's huge activism, mm. you know? So all of us are activists. All of us must be activists. The question is, you know, uh, uh, in what ways are we, you know, uh, are changing Giving. lives? Because mm -hmm. activism ultimately is not about what you do to be seen. Activism is about whether you can conscientize people, change somebody's understanding of one thing. 
their understanding of migrants and xenophobia, their mm -hmm. understanding of homophobia, their understanding of impoverishment and poverty. Mm. And then secondly, touching people's lives. That's activism. Activism is not these big things of growing to movements. Mm. We seem to be doing things. No. Yeah. Activism is about active everyday action, changing society at multiple levels. Yeah, I hear you. Lastly, to bring us to a close, can you please tell us in four words what do you still, what would you still like to achieve? So oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't work like that. You know, I I I, I sit at the beginning of the year, mm. and I said, where can I contribute? Mm. At home, with my friends, mm. and with the movement that I belong to, right? Mm. And then I say, I go sit with other people to say, how can we make this thing, thing happen? Mm. What would you like me to contribute, right? Mm. So it's very, very difficult. It looks like I don't plan ahead. But really, is this idea that I should be guided by the needs rather than what I want to achieve? But I've achieved so much, you know, academically, activism. I now have a family. I have a boy who is now asking for my attention here. Yeah. So really, I don't mm. know what else I would still want to achieve. I, I, I'm happy where I am. Mm. Yeah. Ah, Prof, thank you so much for, for giving us your time and allowing us to probe your mind the way that you have today. Um, we can only hope that we will follow in your footsteps and that we will also not get weary and that we will also continue to serve our communities in, in various respects. So I just want to thank you. And I hope that our listeners as well, um, I, I have no doubt that they, they will have, they have received value from our discussion. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Prof. And I hope you keep well. Until we meet thank again. You, thank you. I'm sorry that I was speaking from the park. Uh, I'm sure if I was sitting in an office, a little bit more coherent and more, uh, yeah, not no, no. So, like I've been a rally. So, Don't worry about yeah, it. That's a condition normal. of working from home. <laughs> yeah, Thank it's you so our much. new normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm, okay. okay. Keep well. Thank Bye. you so much. Keep well. Thank you. Bye-bye. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to a close. That was Professor and Dr. Tepo Madlingozi, and that concludes our episode today about the history, application, and the context of the Constitution. <laughs>